Today our class is on the an analects of Confucius. Before the actual class, I would like to then address a few things that, um, uh, in fact, the monastics, when they circumambulate the um, mandala on the peak of the mountain over there, really ask those of you to circumambulate them. The, the mandala according to the dates, because on different dates, there are outer nations of uh, the different genders could go and uh, um, circumambulate the mandala. So in terms of our uh, regulation over here, I really hope that you could then abide uh, such rules that we have, especially for the monastics. And uh, this time, I really ask all the lay practitioners also to abide this rule. For people who only stay here for a week or so, then it's OK. But uh, for people who live here for a long period of time, then I really ask those of you to then abide the rules and uh, only go when it is your turn on the specific dates. For people who come here only for a week, I think it's OK. But more than a week, then you should abide this rule as well. In fact, all the lamas and jumos, the female and male uh, monastics, they also have uh, very different rules. So they also abide their own rules. So uh, I really hope that that's something that you need to pay attention to, especially now we are talking about uh, the uh, ritual propriety and the vows, the monastic vows, are also considered as part of the ritual propriety. Some, some of the lay practitioners, when they come here, and uh, um, they probably don't have a particular kind of goal to attain over here. So. I really encourage those of you who uh, are here studying the Dharma, then uh, just really focus on the Dharma rather than uh, breaking different rules. And uh, um, I don't think it's a, a wise thing to do. So today our class is on the analects. In fact, I think this is quite useful to all of us. And this time when we're studying it together, I feel this is quite necessary. Uh, I know that lots of people knew about the analects before, but not necessarily understand what it means. Especially a lot of people probably don't even understand or have um, an idea about it. You know that it is, it is a famous text, but how and what it is talking about, how could it help you, and so on, you probably had no idea. But I think it really has lots of teachings, lots of pith instructions, to, so to speak, uh, in terms of how to be a good person, how to be human. In um, in this text, it has lots of the very concise instructions on how to be a hum how to be a person, and uh, uh, lots of these kind of teachings are quite similar to those of teachings uh, that's included in Mahayana texts. And I really see that many people who are attending this online and so on, you are really listening to it uh, very attentively. And I'm quite encouraged to see many of you who are attending this class are, in fact, quite um, 
quite attentive and very and attached a great importance to this class and don't really miss classes. That's really great. So let's now move to one point twelve. So over here it talks about the rights and uh, uh, harmony, where Master Yuzi said that harmony is what is most prized in the practice of the rites. It is what makes the way of the former king beautiful, and this principle applies to matters big and small. So this kind of right that creates a harmony is in fact uh, used by the previous emperors, such as a Yao Shun and Yu Emperor as well as uh, lots of great kings in terms of uh, ruling their countries. And for the kings, it is the most beautiful actions. Uh, it is the most beautiful action to take. In fact, when we talk about rights, it also could be explained in the aspect of art because arts are, in fact, quite broad. When we talk about the vows and precepts and uh, actions and uh, rules or regulations, it could be an act of conduct, uh, art of conduct. It could be art of speech. It could be art of uh, uh, rituals, such as uh, prostrations and so on. So as a king, by using such kind of ritual, in fact, it then uh, could further help the king. Because when we look at everyone in this world, uh, there are the elders and uh, juniors, and there are the ones who are higher in the hierarchy and the lower in the hierarchy. Unlike animals, where they um, basically are the same, but in human beings, it is quite important to use such rights or use such arts of being human. It is part. It is considered as a part of the regulation, and uh, by adapting those regulations, then we can achieve harmony. And this kind of achieving harmony is, in fact, quite precious and should be cherished. So the former kings, they would uptake such rights, and the way they take such rights, such as the uh, judicial system and laws and so on, in fact, they could be also called uh, or be included in the rights area or category. And next, it says that to apply this principle of right, apply uh, to matters big and small. And when people don't think that this is necessary to use rights, then they cannot achieve harmony. Sometimes it is also then explained in the way that it says that big or small matters, in fact, they cannot be uh, completely separated from rights. If you aim only at achieving harmony in everything, then you only under then you're really only trying to achieve harmony because you feel that this is ideal to do so. If you were to only try to achieve a harmony in the superficial level because you know this is the ideal situation, then lots of things won't work because people don't really follow the rules to start with, the, but they want to achieve harmony, such as uh, the interpersonal relationships between uh, teacher and students and between the senior and junior, and so on. For example, according to the ancient culture, it is said that the students have their particular uh, status and then the teachers have their status and then the teacher and then the students should respect their parent their uh, teachers 
Just as it is said in the Sigalavada Sutra, where it says that uh, between the teachers and students, there are five things that uh, they should do to each other to venerate, to respect each other, and uh, towards the spouses and uh, the parents and uh, children. So there are all five things that's described or require of each side so that both of them will venerate and uh, respect each other, each parties. And then there will be uh, harmony. For example, however, nowadays it's completely different. It is not really following those kind of rules of uh, respecting each other anymore. In Tibetan language, in fact, in fact, uh, we then use a different tone. We use um, uh, respectful words to. Uh, from the disciple or from the students to the teachers. Uh, but uh, there are different cultures and different languages where they would address everyone as dear so-and-so in their letters. There are things that we should keep a sense of uh, equanimity or equality, such as the requirement from one party to the other, then you should uh, maintain this kind of requirement for each party. But there are, in fact, things that's not really equal, and you should not keep them equal, just as how the juniors should respect the seniors. According to Li Ji, where it says that, uh, the Book of Rights, it says that the sages emerge to teach people with rights or rules of propri propriety such that they can conduct themselves properly, which distinguishes themselves from animals. In fact, animals don't have such a culture of abiding the rules of propri propriety. I think lots of people probably heard of uh, this story. This is a, a story from the Chinese history, history where it says that uh, the king from a Qi dynasty got drunk and he took off all of his uh, hats and uh, his uh, uh, clothing and he was then uh, hitting on uh, a pot and making noises and music and running around and completely completely mad and he was then telling his and then he was asking his uh, retinues saying that as a king who is enjoying with his retinue and his uh, people? Isn't that isn't it right to fully enjoy? And his people replied, saying that his his retinues, um, well, trying to flatter him, uh, then said that, oh, you're doing a great job by enjoying and having fun with us. This is quite correct. There was another. There's a cabinet of the emperor. His name is Yanzi, and Yanzi came to the king well dressed. And at that time, he saw that the king was completely naked and making full of himself. And then the king asked Yanzi, saying that, "Don't you think I'm having a great fun? And uh, isn't this uh, isn't this the right thing to do with my retinues?" And in fact, Yanzi replied saying, no, you're not uh, my king. In fact, the king should have a certain status or hold a certain status. And as your uh, retinue, then we should have a certain status as well. Because as a king, then your power and your uh, wisdom and uh, your knowledge is sur far surpass all of us. And therefore, then you should dress and act propri uh, pro appropriately uh, according to your status. Though the king was uh, his superior, but uh, he got scolded by his cabinet. Nowadays, uh, what I notice is that people would butter up their superiors. They would say, this is wonderful. Whatever you do is wonderful. But in fact, by buttering up your superior, it doesn't really benefit anyone. And then Yanzi continued to say that this is very inappropriate, what you're doing. And then the king continued to ask, saying that, 
well, but everyone else thinks that I am doing a great job. Then should I then kill all of them? And then Yanzi replied, saying, "No, uh, my king, you should not kill all of your retinues, because if you were to maintain uh, the kind of thinking that you should uh, carry out your actions according to the rights, then all your retinues would also follow in such a way." So through this story, what we can see is that. Many people may view rights as something very traditional, very old, and um, it is uh, no longer a timely teaching, no longer a modern teaching. It doesn't uh, go with uh, our modern time and so on. In fact, if you continue to think in such a way, then later on it will definitely take a bitter turn. That is why. We should compare um, the teachings from the traditional uh, teachings to our modern time uh, dilemmas and to our modern time uh, problems, because whenever it is, if we encounter such problems, sometimes it is because that we forgot about our root, that is, and the root teachings that uh, was given in uh, the ancient times. That's 1.12, and now let's move to 1.13. <coughs> <coughs> Last night I slept really late because we had a meeting until uh, 2 or 3 a.m. So I didn't really sleep very well. So today I, I feel like I am dream talking. And if I were to do that, then why don't you um, spread some water on me or so, so that to, <laughs> to wake me up. Next one, Master Yuzi then continued to say, trustworthiness comes close to rightness because your words can be counted on. Respectfulness comes close to ritual propri propriety because it allows you to stay clear of shame and disgrace. If you do not lose the affection of those who are your relatives by marriage, then you could have the respect of your clan. So it has three layers of meanings. The first one talks about trustworthiness. Your, tru your, uh, your trustworthiness, your credit, or or words that you promise to others, you should then make sure that your words are close to your um, actual situation rather than making um, uh, rather than making um, blank checks to others. If you were to make some uh, promises out of frivolousness, then it will hurt your trustworthiness. Just like how young people nowadays that they would make promises really quickly, but later on they get they really regret whatever they did or said. Just like lots of things that happens in life are very difficult to keep. Sometimes it is because they really don't have lots of uh, social ex experiences in society, or they don't have lots of wisdom, or they don't have such persistence. All of these kind of reasons, 
So you should really watch out your own words. On the other hand, you should also be a little bit flexible with all the words you said, because sometimes um, it, you will then turn out to, to be the kind of person who is waiting for a dead rabbit to turn up, to show up. Uh, there was a story that a man waited. Uh, a, a man um, was told that. Uh, his lover will meet him at the pillar uh, around the uh, bridge. And then he waited for a long period of time until the, even when the water rises, he was still over there holding the pillar. And eventually, he died over there right on the spot uh, by, uh, and uh, drowned to death. So. This story tells us that we should not just abide to our words, uh, to our words, uh, with the kind of stiffness and and uh, without any flexibility, without any wisdom. Sometimes we can then make some adjustments, but on the other hand, we should also make sure that our words are trustworthy. So. First of, all, first of all, it talks about the trustworthiness. And the second aspect, then, it talks about the respectfulness comes close to ritual propriety because it allows you to stay clear of shame and disgrace. In fact, respectfulness also need to come to ritual propriety. You should not be, you should have respect and um, uh, you should have respect for others, but you don't have to necessarily to venerate everyone. There are the ones that you should venerate and uh, there are the ones you, you shouldn't uh, venerate in the way that you prostrate to them. Of course, there are the bodhisattva, uh, there, there's the bodhisattva who uh, do not uh, look down at others. That's, a that's uh, recorded in the Lotus Sutra. If you sincerely feel that everyone is the future Buddha, of course it's fine. But on the other hand, if you have no principle when it comes to veneration and respect towards others, if you yourself do not have any principle for yourself, then in such a way, no one will look at you with respect. Around June, around June this year, four young girls went out to have dinner. And then four of them, at the end of the dinner, in fact, they uh, all wanted to pay for the bill. So they started fighting over the bill. And uh, at that time, a young girl who wanted to pay for the whole meal, and uh, the other three didn't want her to because sh her family situation is not the best out of the four. And then the f so, and then four of them started fighting and fighting over to pay the bill, and one of them. In fact, uh, one of them then committed suicide because she couldn't fight over the the bill. I think this is very. I think this is very difficult to um, to understand. In the West, they whenever they go out for dinner, they usually go Dutch. This is probably the easier. In Tibetan saying that we say that it is important to maintain good relationship with a friend, but it is important also to keep a clear um, to keep a clear math in terms of uh, the money. In fact, this is the right. This is kind of the um, 
regulation or rules that you should follow. It is the best that you could follow the kind of rights at the beginning, so that later on you will maintain a harmonious instead of、uh, having different fights or having arguments among、uh, the money issues or、uh, with the. Interpersonal relationships. It is really the best to follow the rights to start with. So over here, it says that respect is in in fact extremely important. But you should also、uh, you should then respect your seniors. You should respect your teachers. There are people who say that what's the point of being respectful towards teachers and、uh, parents? What's the point of that?、And、then I'll tell you the story of Ponce Garamboche. Ponce Garamboche, when he went to、uh, United States, and、uh, um, lots of people asked,、uh, said to Ponce Garamboche that、uh, what's the point of、uh, paying respect to you? You are of equal to us. And Ponce Garamboche said, "Well, if you treat me as equal, it's just like when your president comes and、uh, kick,、uh, and if you were to kick at him." What do you think? Is that fair and is is that reasonable? Don't you think if you were to do that,、uh, don't you think his guards will、uh, capture you right away? So there are some differences in terms of hierarchies. In In the ancient times, at that time, there were not lots of people, but they had lots of rights to follow. In Tibet, we say that it is,、uh, in fact, there are lots of,、uh, there are lots of、uh, teachings in terms of how to do every single thing in your life, such as、uh, what kind of、uh, ladle you should use in order to、um, get the、uh, drinks for your guests, and、uh, which. Direction the matter should be facing, and so on. Yes, on one hand, it seems that we follow certain kind of rights. We follow some kind of、uh, customs. I think the differences comes from the different customs and different cultures that you grew up in. We should not just use the simplicity、uh, mentality of、uh, modern times to judge everyone. We should not then accept all the modern mentality in our hearts and to consider that this is the right thing to do. And we should not completely reject the traditional values as.、Um, As trash, this is also inappropriate. So we should not go on、uh, any of the extremes. We should then take whatever is beneficial and useful to us, and we should abandon or not really listen to the ones that's not、uh, very useful or beneficial to people and to yourself. If you do not lose the affection, in fact, the third la layer of the meaning has many different kinds of、uh, explanations. For example, there is the explanation where it says that because there were kindness being paid to you, therefore you should hold、uh, affection and closeness to that person, and in such a way. You will be able to earn respect because of such kind of affection and closeness.、Uh, you will be able to continuously to、uh, connect to the other person who have shown kindness to you. So that's one way of explaining it. And the second way of explaining it is that、uh, if you keep the affection inside of the marriage. Then, in such a way, your client should can be then continued on, because through such kind of interpersonal relationships, such as marriage and so on, you'll be able to continue your、uh, culture, your family heritage, and your clan. The third one, third explanation, it says that.
By relying upon the ones who uh, you feel very close to, then you can pass down the culture and heritage of your own. And in such a way, you can be respected by your clan. What it means is that about relying to the kind of people who uh, show kindness to you or uh, rely on your spouse or rely on people who uh, have closeness to you, have a sense of closeness to you, then you'll be able to pass down this kind of culture and heritage of your clan. In fact, what it, what it emphasized over here is the sense of warmness um, among people a sense of warmth among people. This is quite important because between one another as human beings, we need communication and warmth, especially nowadays in our modern time. Buddhists and non-Buddhists, in fact, in this world, I think this world is uh, in the face of uh, uh, making contributions by co cooperations. What people name us nowadays is that we are the concrete worms because we all live in concrete, sit, concrete sit, cities. Whatever we do outside business, studying Buddhism, all kinds of things. In fact, we need that kind of synergy comes comes from community. We need to be in good relationship with our superior, with our inferiors, with our equals. This is all quite important. Unless you're a Pratika Buddha, you are a good practitioner who can stay in a cave solo and being a one-man band, one-man practitioner in the cave, only drink clear water and eat grass, this is in fact even uh, this is in fact quite difficult in modern time as well. So in our modern time, we really need cooperation. We uh, need to work with others. In the analects, they continuously to talk about the rights and uh, the righteousness and. Uh, ritual pro uh, propriety, where it then point out, uh, points to the interpersonal relationships of uh, parents and children, of uh, spouses, of uh, friends, and so on. This kind of net of relationships is quite important to maintain a good communication and uh, uh, communi uh, communication and connections to one another. If you were to remember that in the Sikalavada Sutra where we talked about the directions, where there were four directions and then the up and lower, where then it points out that we're the ones in the center, so we really need to relate to each other. I translated the Sikalavada Sutra into Tibetan, and I'm almost done with it because I noticed that this sutra is not translated into Tibetan language and I thought it would be quite meaningful. In, in Tibet, I think we really take the words of the Buddha very um, close to our heart and I think this sutra will be of great benefit to lots of the Tibetan people. Anyhow, I really want to emphasize this is quite important. And 1.14. 1 1.14. Now, Master started to say, it is like 
Confucius sometimes would say something, and uh, sometimes he would let his uh, disciples to say something. Anyhow, over here it is the Confucius uh, that uh, the master said, "A uh, gentleman does not try to stuff himself when he eats, and is not worried about the comfort of his dwelling. He is anxious about getting things done and careful about what he says." In fact. A gentleman, or um, someone who has rather a bigger perspective and a lots of long learnings, uh, and then and then um, in fact, they only care about um, the knowledge rather than uh, their food and uh, a residence. Recently, there was someone who wanted a good food, and uh, they would drive and uh, uh, drive to a long, uh, farther away place to eat, and then come back to work again. I think this is rather inappropriate. On the other hand, I do care about the quality of meal of the food, because over here we do have the kind of uh, meal that is offered to the sangha, and uh, the meal that is made to offer to the, our staff members. I do care about the quality of those. However, on the other hand, as a practitioner, I think it is quite important to maintain or have a sense of contentment in Larongar. A few years back, people would only eat tsampa, that is the ba barley flour. They would eat it three times a day and every day. At that time, we didn't even have any vegetables. We don't even hear the name of vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> it is just like how in some um, uh, some faraway land where <laughs> people don't even hear the name of the Buddha, so we didn't even hear any names of vegetable. When I went to some uh, mainland uh, practitioners' uh, uh, homes, and uh, I noticed what they do is to make some rice porridge, and then. Uh, mixed it with some chili pepper, and that's all the meals they eat. Are you all eating like that? You used to eat like that. So that was the kind of conditions that we had at, that, uh, at the time. And we didn't really have lots of uh, distractions at the time. Uh, we only used our time to study. We don't even sleep as much. All of our main goal at the time was to study. So do not have too much high requirements towards the eating and food and meal. Do not get over luxury when it comes to meals. And the second one is that when it comes to your residence and to where you live, do not worry about do not worry about the comfort of uh, your dwelling. The other day, I saw a practitioner about a two or three days ago. I saw some practitioner who moved bags and bags of stuff to his small hut. And then at that time, I asked him, why do you have so much stuff? In fact, I think now, since you live in such a simple valley, why don't you keep your life also simple? Because if you were to have too many stuff, you would also get very much distracted, isn't it? I understand that you need some uh, material. But since you are living in this simple valley, then why don't you keep your life simple as well? As I notice, lots of uh, Theravada monks and practitioners, and they keep their life rather very simple, really, uh, and really easy uh, to feel contentment. Uh, 
When I went to Thailand and uh, Cambodia, uh, I visited a few monks and monastics uh, residents. What I noticed was that they, in fact, live in very simple lifestyle, and I felt quite a lot of admiration towards them. So we should be content with whatever meal and uh, residence that we can live, and uh, we should be very content with uh, the simplicity of uh, livelihood. And then, we should be diligent with whatever we do, um, because you should be anxious about getting things done and careful about what you say. So you should be uh, diligent and careful uh, when it comes to work. Uh, when it comes to work, and when it comes to speech, you should say whatever you should say and do not say things that you shouldn't say. So you should have a sense of propriety about the speech. And then it says that he gravitates towards those who possess a moral integrity because he wants to put himself right. On one hand, we should work and uh, uh, benefit others with great diligence, and we should be content with a simple lifestyle. At the same time, we should then rely on the ones who are wise and uh, uh, who are of great learning. And in such a way, you can say that this kind of person is someone who loves learning. So you should really enjoy learning. You should. Uh, you are gravitated towards those who possess the moral integrity. In fact, Confucius is uh, someone who is very much cur curious about knowledge and very much gravitated towards knowledge. A student of uh, Confucius, his name is Yan Hui. And he's also of the same personality of Confucius. He is very much gravitated towards learning as well. And uh, out of the teachings given by Confucius, someone said that uh, Yan Hui, in fact, exemplified the gentleman in the description according to, um, according to Confucius. Because Yan Hui is the most eager to learn and was content to be living in a, a shabby neighborhood on a, a bowl full of millets and a ladle full of water. We really need this kind of. We really need this kind of uh, uh, spirit in our excessive materialistic world. Especially nowadays, in the past a hundred years, not many poets and uh, great literature or great Buddhists uh, uh, appeared uh, within the last a hundred years. Why is that? When you think about it, it is then a time of a uh, great leap of um, um, material, but uh, a great decrease of spiritual wealth. And people get very much dwelled in the materialistic uh, searching instead of the searching for spiritual and uh, uh, learning aspect of uh, human life. Nowadays, the young people, they get they dwell in lots of the junk culture and junk knowledge. I heard uh, young people would then uh, uh, get loans and uh, borrow money for uh, to support their luxurious lifestyle. Don't even mention about uh, a year or two years for them to repay this money back. They, I don't think they can then repay the money back uh, for uh, even within their lifetime. Nowadays, there are young people who 
then get really obsessed with animation and all these kind of uh, anime cartoons and uh, all of uh, those kind of uh, all of those uh, uh, products that is developed based on certain animation and cartoons. Lots of advertisements are made, and young people without any experience in this uh, society, without lots of money, but they would invest their they, they would invest their salary to buy the collected, uh, collective version as well as limited edition of uh, those uh, uh, toys and those uh, sculptures or so. They're very childish. But let's then contemplate if they are so childish in their interest, what kind of personalities they have, what kind of maturity of their spiritual life is. I think this is something that you should really investigate. What is the world, the value, uh, the world and uh, the value uh, the young people have towards nowadays? They don't think about the, how to benefit others. They don't think about how to uh, then elevate their spiritual life or so. They only then get very much dwelled in this kind of materialistic things and this juvenile materialistic things. And, uh, and, and young people would even take loans in order to buy those toys for themselves. And they get very much, uh, they get very much um, attracted to all the little toys and the different additions that sold by the uh, companies and uh, uh, manufacturers. In some ways, it's almost like they're addicted. And I've met some of those uh, uh, drug addicts, and uh, uh, their mentality is exactly the same. Doesn't matter how much the parents or the uh, teachers would advise them, they would not. They would not change their habits, let it be uh, animation and cartoons or games. It is, in fact, it could be called the um, game, uh, game uh, addicts. So eager to learn is, in fact, not easy. And it's very difficult. It's even more difficult to find the kind of young people who are most eager to learn. We should look at those previous master's stories, such as Master Hui Yuan's story, who is the first, pa first patriarch of the Pure Land School. He met Master Dawan, and Master Huiyan studied under Master Dawan for three years. And at that time, his wisdom and his knowledge was very much uh, then was very much matured. And then he continued to practice. Eventually, all the dharmas that's taught by Master Dawan was all the teachings taught by Master Dai was completely understood by Master Hui Yuan. I think by the age of 24, Master Hui Yuan started giving teachings on Prajna Paramita teachings. And later on, Master Dawan said that Master Hui Yuan, Hui Yuan will be the one who propagate the teachings that I gave, and uh, he is the hope of this uh, of the teaching of uh, Pure Land. In fact, during the studying period of time of Master Hui Yuan, he was not distracted. He was very much focused in terms of uh, uh, his eagerness of uh, learning. So I really hope other practitioners 
could maintain a simplicity, maintain simplicity in your lifestyle, do not have too much requirements, and do not get too distracted, because mundane beings can be distracted very easily, and then. In such a way, your actions can be purified, and the knowledge that you studied could be beneficial to the sentient beings as well as yourself. I know that the analects is considered as a traditional culture teaching. And uh, in fact, I been reading different commentaries from different people. There are so many commentaries, and it's very difficult for me to squeeze out my time to read all the commentaries. But I feel that it is quite important to read as many as possible. I myself, I really enjoy books, but um, uh, I know because of the time limits, at least I, I really wish that you could read at least or one or two commentaries. These are a few books that I reference to. This one is from a traditional scholar. Uh, he uh, his name is Tian Mu, and uh, at first he moved to Yale University, and uh, he couldn't understand uh, English at that time. So he used his spare time to then wrote a commentary on the Analects. And this is from uh, Master Oyi, and his commentary is more based on the. Buddhist point of view is from that perspective, and this one is from uh, a lay practitioner living nun, and uh, he used lots of teachings quoted from the four books and the five uh, classical teachings. And this one's from Master Na Hua Jing, and also I have a book such as uh, uh, Wisdom of Confucius and uh, Explanations of uh, Analects and so on. I have many commentaries. Unfortunately, I don't have too much time, but at least I feel that if I were to uh, make reference of a few books, it would be great. <coughs> This is so. This this video is made so that you don't fall in sleep. So let's then talk about one point fifteen. Uh, I'll try my best to finish this teaching today. One point fifteen. It is stated by Zigong. Zigong said, "Poor but not." Ingratiating, because when people are poor, then they would uh, have lots of wrong conducts. And as someone who is rich, when rich but not arrogant, that's the question that is asked for uh, asked to Confucius, saying that I think this is really the best when the poor. Uh, that's what the poor and the rich should do. What do you think of this? Say, but Confucius didn't say that. Great, great. He didn't say that. He said that is all right, but better still is poor but joyful, rich but loving the rights. Over here, it says that poor but joyful. In some editions, it says that uh, poor but enjoy the uh, the correct path. So Confucius said that this is all right, but what is better is that if the poor ones. Not only ingratiating. In fact, at that time, the poor, if the poor could enjoy the path, that would be even better. And other than poor but not arrogant, uh, uh, other than rich but not arrogant, uh, it would be even better if they're rich but loving the rights. So in such a way, isn't it even better? And then Zigong said, the oldest says, filled, smoothed, 
carved and polished. Isn't that what you mean? So Zigong said that uh, according to the oldest, uh, there is uh, uh, this description or this uh, quote where it is says that it should be filed, smooth, carved, and polished. So step by step, isn't that even better? There are different kinds of explanations on this. Some say that uh, the filed and uh, smooth and carved and polished are then uh, explained in the way that some of them is is carved or, or split it into bigger shapes and then slowly into smaller shapes and later uh, finally to be polished. And then uh, there's another explanation. It is said that according to different kind of uh, materials, you should do different things. The bones uh, filed and the tusk smoothed, like jade carved and stone polished. So that's one level of the meaning. Another explanation is that jade should then first be carved. For example, a material, if you were to then shape it into certain things, that first you need to uh, cut it and then uh, file it and then smooth it and then carve it and then use smaller tools and uh, uh, so on to then do detailed carve and detailed uh, detailed um, uh, cutting and then later on at the end you should then polish it to smooth it so there are different kind of steps just as how the rich ones at the first they should start off by practicing non arrogance and then um, they can practice on loving the rights and then the poor should not ingratiating at the beginning and then slowly you should learn to be joyful about uh, attending the the path just like how in buddhism there are the uh, preliminary practices and the men practice and then the dedication merits and there are different kinds of stages so that um, so that's the kind of path and there are the preliminary practices and then you enter into generation stage and perfection stage so just just like that In Italy, there is a sculpture called David. This is quite a worldly renowned sculpture. I'm sure you've heard about it. And this is sculpted by Michelangelo. He carved this sculpture out of a large marble. And this large marble stayed and lying in the center of the court for 25 years. And uh, later on, Michelangelo, at the age of 26, sculpted David, the world-renowned the world renowned sculpture based on uh, the historical figure. Uh, who lived around 1000 CE. When I went to Jerusalem, there were lots of stories about the King David. The figure, the figure, the sculpture was not, was uh, rather, uh, the sculpture was uh, uh, sculpted, uh, the, the sculpture was naked the, the way that uh, Michelangelo um, sculpted and uh, I know that around uh, the Renaissance uh, a lot of the sculptures and paintings were in fact naked I know lots of you are very conservative, especially those of you who follow the teachings of Confucius and uh, traditional teachings. And uh, sometimes when you see those naked uh, sculptures, you feel very much uh, afraid or ashamed or embarrassed. And there are lots of complexity of the feelings uh, within people of such kind of uh, uh, a conservative, a conservative uh, uh, mentality. 
including to uh, in Bhutan, there are uh, phalluses that's painted around the doors and so on. So people who have such kind of conservative mentality uh, could feel that uh, looking at those kind of paintings and sculptures and, and uh, the and the paintings of uh, Tonka and so on, you would feel quite embarrassed as well. And you would feel rather embarrassed to see the phalluses painted on the wall of uh, uh, Around the on the walls in Bhutan and uh, uh, naked paintings and sculptures in the West, you may feel very difficult to accept those kind of phenomena. But in fact, people have a very different uh, point of view and a very different kinds of. Uh, they grew up in very different kinds of traditions and tra and uh, cultures. In the West, they feel that human body is art. The sculptors and the artists, when they're making such kind of, when they're making such kind of artworks, they are also then made of. They're also made of rights. I think the sculpture of David has been there for 500 over 500 years and the sculptors and artists when they first see this sculpture they would feel that it brings the culture and wisdom and artistic view artistic feelings and uh, on the contrary, lots of people who have rather a different kind of mentality, a different kind of a conservative mentality, they would once they see this kind of images, they would feel lots of afflictions and lots of uh, mental poisons. Um, just like the other day when we told the story how there are some shrimps and uh, uh, some uh, ocean animals, in fact, in fact, then uh, uh, live in the temperature of 450 Celsius and degrees. And uh, lots of people once seen such kind of shrimps, the first thought came to them is how to cook them, because 100 Celsius degrees cannot cook them anymore. So just like that, people have very different uh, mentality. And I really feel lots of people have very narrow mind, uh, have lots of narrow mindedness. Anyhow, just like that, over here, the master said, uh, Zigo, only with you can one, only with you uh, can one discuss the odious. Someone tells you something and you can see it, see its relevance to what is not said. In fact, there's another explanation saying that now I feel that you truly understand the relevance. I can then give you the main teachings, just like how the, some masters would say that you don't have to practice the preliminary practices anymore. I can give you the main practice. And then you'll be able to understand what comes. Uh, you'll be able to practice the main practice. And uh, uh, what Confucius says that it is quite important that you see the relevance of the different kinds of knowledges. And Confucius. In fact, a priest, uh, Zigo. In fact, the traditional teaching of the Odis, it has lots of the subtle teachings within. It is not only poems. So now. <laughs> So Confucius is said to Zico saying that now I can give you the, I can now give you the actual teaching. I can give you the piece of instruction now. <laughs> Just like how people came to me saying that, can you give me some piece of instructions? And I would reply to them, okay, I'll give you a piece of instruction. That's 1.15. So now let's move to the last one, which is 1.16. 1.16 is stated by the master, and he said that do not worry, 
that other pe what other people do not know you, but be concerned that you do not know them. If their people do not know you, that's okay. Nowadays, people continuously to complain that, why don't you understand me? Why don't you understand me? They would continuously to to complain. But Confucius, what he said is that it's it's good. And do not worry that other people do not know you. This is a kind of a state, uh, this is a kind of uh, practice insights and practice a uh, certain kind of level of practice that you've attained. And then it says that, but be concerned that you do not know them. Because if you do not know others, then you won't be able to benefit others. If you were to benefit others, you have to know what their mind thinks. In Chinese saying, it is said that you know the person, you know uh, their, f their faces, but you don't know their minds. Nowadays, people have complete different understanding of this. People would feel that it's fine, I don't understand others. But others has to understand me. They can't misunderstand me. Because I've given so much, I have contributed so much. Just like nowadays, if people wanted to get famous, nowadays they want to be known by others. They make lots of videos and uh, live streaming including some uh, some lamas, uh, they would say that, just like how some disciples would complain to their lamas, saying that, why don't you know me? Why don't you know me? If you don't know me, you can't be my lama. In fact, the teaching over here is quite profound. Majority of time, we really hope that other people understand us, others could comfort us, others could then help us, others uh, could do all everything to us. But over here, what it says is that instead of asking for help from others or asking others to understand us, instead of uh, those, you should contemplate that do you care about others? Do you understand others? According to the uh, Sakya Pandita's treasury of good advice, it says that always ignoring the interest of others is to behave in the same way as, cast, as the cattle. Is it not possible even for animals merely to acquire food and drink? If you only want to enjoy your life in such a frivolous way, but do not have any of the interest of getting to know or to benefit others, then what's the difference between such a kind of person to, uh, to animals? Just, just as there's the kind of deer, uh, the deers or animals, they uh, don't have a morality. So it says that I don't really worry about if other people do not know me. What I really care about is that, or what I really concern about is that I do not know others. So this is something to remember today from today's class. For example, if you are a manager or if you are a superior of certain department, then you should care about others. You should think about that it is it doesn't matter if other people do not care about me or do not know me, do not understand me. But what I care about is that <coughs> I should know others. So it is says that it's OK if people do not know me. But what I really care about is 
I should know others. In the Confucius teachings, it doesn't really point out the mind of benefiting others like the Mahayana teachings. But when it comes to caring and understanding others around us, I think this kind of teachings should also be uh, learned by us. This kind of teaching is, in fact, quite important. And we need to reflect upon such kind of teachings. And if, if we were to study in such a way and uh, understand in such a way, I think it would be able, to, uh, and I think it will make us a better person. Just as uh, in the Sutra of Sublime Dharma of Clear Recollection, where it says that one who experiences the joy of wealth but never indulge in heedlessness is a wise man. If you don't understand others, if you don't make connection to others, I think one will live in a, a suffering situation. You should not build your happiness upon others' suffering. Instead, you should try to achieve your own happiness by creating auspicious or happy connections with, with others. And your own happiness should be built upon your own as well. You should be able to have the ability to make yourself happy. So we've finished the, then the first book. I will give you announcement of the next class on the analects later. I think I'll give you, I'll post the schedule later. Should be October 5th, I think. October 5th. Maybe not. Maybe not on October 5th. Maybe October 12th. Something like that.